for much. Ray, I'm not sure how to start other than to think, well, I just followed two lawyers. So the only thing I can think about is we talked about tax evasion and Al Capone. So I'm guilty. I, I don't know what else to say. I'm guilty. Um, so Ray, thanks for the opportunity to come in, uh, and speak to, speak to these folks here today. So before I get into the three pillars and what I'm going to talk about, and they are, as you see behind me, education, uh, engineering, and enforcement, I'm going to tell you a little story so that it gives you something to kind of uh, base what I'm going to talk about. So not unlike many of you today, uh, my day starts now a little earlier than usual because my military background, but it starts at 0445 every day. And it starts by this device. And this device sounds off. I enter my access code. I check my emails as I roll over in the dark. I respond to what I need to from a security perspective. I roll out of bed. I go downstairs. I go into the gym. I grab my what is it, iPod. I stick that on. I stick on the monitor. I throw Bloomberg up there. I watch what's happening in the FTSE, the CAC, the whole market piece. I get on my spin cycle and I do my workout for 45 minutes. So then I come back up my stairs in my house and I can hear the same thing happening with my wife. Because her Blackberry is going off. She's doing the exact same thing that I am. So we kind of high five each other at the stairwell. She goes downstairs. I go into the bedroom, grab my computer, have my phone, turn on the TV, put Bloomberg on so I can see what's going on. And I wait for my daughter, who's four years old, to wake up. And the first thing she does, besides ask me to take her to the washroom, of course, is, Dad, can I watch something? Can I watch Dora? Sure, honey. So I grab the iPad. So now we're sitting on a bed. We have a TV on. I have this. I have a computer on. I have to give her the iPad so she can watch Dora. So my computer's now tuned into the market, and I start to read the daily papers. Okay, so that's, that's the first hour. Okay? So... Then it's time for me to transition into the work mode, so I do my, get into my gear, I go out the door, kiss everybody, wave goodbye. This thing syncs up to my car, Sirius radio comes on, I listen to Bloomberg and away I go. And now I'm in my mobile office, right? And I'm going down the road and for sure I'm going to have a conference call with somebody in the UK or something else at 0630 in the morning. I get into the office in the morning, I go, first I go into the parkade and I got a cat card and I need a cat card to get inside the parkade, right? So access the door, so the door opens, it allows me to go inside. I then go in the building, I got another card that allows me to get into the elevator to go up there. When I come out of the elevator, then I go and I, I've got an iris, and I've got to zoom in and focus in on my eyes, it says, yeah, you are who you say you are. So then that allows me to go into the door. Then I get into my office, and I've got that strange thing called a key, which seems archaic now, but I've got this key, and I open up the door, and I go in there, and I take my personal computer, and I place it on my desk beside my corporate computer, and now my corporate computer hooked up to the intranet allows me to access that world with my personal phone and my corporate phone beside me, that BYOD piece, right? Bring your own device, okay? And then, of course, what happens is I get bombarded by both of them, right? So whether it's the Outlook invites, I'm looking at what my calendar is, my assistant comes in to tell me what I need to do, I've got to read these PDF documents, I've got a, uh, I've got a video conference at 8 o'clock, all of these things are going on, and this is two hours into my day. Are you kidding me? How are we gonna, how are we gonna compete, folks? So, so I wanna give you that story so that when I speak about these three key things here, they have some merit, right? Because I, I harbor a guess here. I, I'll guarantee you that 90% of the people in this room, although the time at 045 may not be the same, what I just described, it's probably very similar for most of us here, okay? So let's talk about education. So we have a, a responsibility, I think, as first of all, as parents, right? Go back to my story. To educate our children because they're going into this, this battle space they have no idea about with belligerents that we all collectively understand who they are and how they behave. Uh, so we have to ask some, some pretty serious questions from a personal perspective. Am I doing the right things? Am I educating my child? Am I educated? Do I understand what's happening in IMAT? It's great, I work for an IT company, but can I keep up with the 24 millisecond change of technology? Right? Am I being educated on a regular basis? Not once a year when the corporation says, oh, go on your website and click off the box in corporate 101 security. And you race through as fast as you can because all you want to do is get back to work. Right? So is, is that being responsible? Am I educating myself 
right? So that's the personal side. From a corporate side, the corporation flip side turns around and says, am I doing the right things to enable and empower my people? Am I educating them on a regular cycle? Am I allowing them to be enabled and empowered to move forward in a business perspective, right? To be truthful to the clients. And from a societal perspective, education is probably the most difficult. Let me give you a story. So, judging by some gray hair in the room, I'm gonna assume that there's probably some folks who remember the 70s in this room. I don't have any, well I have gray hair, you just don't see it. Um, Marble Man, okay, anybody? Marble Man, just wave hands. Marble Man, USA, Com you know. Okay, a few people. So, Marble Man in the 70s and the 80s, the commercials were out there. We saw him in Time Magazine. Uh, stellar, gritty kind of guy. Got the, got the cool hair going. He's in Montana or in Alberta in our case. He's riding the horse. He's got five days unshaven, the Stetson, and he's got a cigarette in his mouth. And man, is he cool. I mean, he is so cool. Hollywood loves this guy, right? So the 70s and the 80s, from a social engineering standpoint, look where we've come today as society around smoking, right? Now Canada may be a little bit more stringent, I'll say, in some of our own cities and uh, st uh, provinces where there's places you can't even smoke outside in Canada, right? Europe's a little bit more relaxed, but regardless, that transition from a social engineering standpoint has moved two decades forward to where now it's, it's unacceptable to smoke. You can't smoke in an airplane. It's very difficult to find a restaurant that you can smoke in. But it took us two decades to get there. So now I'll go back to my, my story, right? So there's my four-year-old daughter. What's my job in education as a person, as a professional, and as a member of society, right, to move it forward as far as cyber is concerned and cyber literacy perspective? That's the first piece. So engineering. I have an engineering background, computer networks as well as telecommunications. But I'm not talking about that piece of engineering. I'm talking about the tools themselves, all right? So whether it's data diodes, firewalls, ADS, APS, uh, anti-script kits, whatever you're using from a tool perspective that allows us, go back to the personal, the professional, and the corporate, the societal, whatever allows us to build brick and mortar around our information, as was spoken by both the lawyers today, how important that information is, how freely it flows, the proxy war in which we, we, we compete on a, on a global background. Um, so that, the engineering side of that, the tools that we use, they have to dovetail back to the education because those tools are great, but you know what? I want to know somewhat, someone tell me in this room they know how to use the entire suite of Microsoft products, Excel and Word. Can, can anybody tell me that they know confidently? Can they come up and demonstrate to me how they use those products? No one can. I guarantee you that. Why? Because we have tools that are moving at that speed and we don't have the education because as personal, professional, and societal members, we are not being educated, right? So those tools to, to us as a whole, they cause us great grief at the end of the day because we may know something about one specific tool, but we don't know the suite. We don't know how to operate in our own environment. So here we are operating in a cyber environment with information flowing freely, and we don't know how to use the tools. Why? Why don't we? Why don't we take the time? Why are, why are we not being educated? Right? So that's the engineering side that I'm referring to. So enforcement. So I'm going to go back to my Canadian colleagues uh, here at the table. Um, Martin mentioned specifically about PIPEDA, or PIPEDA, or however you want to pronounce it. It's personal information protection, okay, in Canada. So to go segue on to what Martin talked about, there is an amendment in Canada right now, it's, a, it's an act called C-12 that was issued last year that's currently sitting in the House right now that gets more specific around what are the roles and responsibilities of government from an enforcement side of the House, okay? And currently it's sitting there, and I think the opposition party has it right now, and we're hopeful to see it move forward and come into power. And really what it states in layman's terms is the privacy commissioner, tomorrow if the public or private entity has an information breach, the privacy commissioner is responsible to take that information and then enforce it, right? 
provide the enforcement. So they've got to build the policy and the governance, but they have to actually enforce. Okay, so, so out of curiosity, last year when that bill got tabled, another good friend of mine who's a Crown prosecutor in Alberta, we were talking about this act, and I said to him, so how many people are in the privacy commissioner's office? And he says, geez, I don't know. I said, so are they aware of what's happening here? I mean, what's the impact on the privacy commissioner's office? They're the enforcement, right? They're the law. Storm out the gates. Computer and uh, emergency response teams, whatever. They're the people that are going to uh, hold, hold, it, hold down the fort. So, so we called the privacy commissioner. It's my right. Paid official. I pay taxes. And we had a conversation. And then we went and met with the privacy commissioner. We said, so just out of curiosity, when this law comes into place, what do you have that's going to allow you to enforce these, this governance, this, these policies? Six people. So I said, okay, so how many calls do you get per year? You know, have you done a trend extrapolation over the last five years from a cyber perspective to understand what's going on in your office? Well, we think it's about 1,500 calls a year. I said, okay. So now the law comes in tomorrow. What does that look like? How many calls do you get? Who's going to respond? Who's going to go out and enforce these policies that we've put in place? Hmm, okay, well, that's an opportunity to write a 24999 contract in Canada and help figure out what that is. So, so we went down the road with the privacy commissioner and we, we took a whole bunch of information from a broad, a broad focus and we brought all that information back and we figured out conservatively that the privacy commissioner's office would get 15,000 calls a year when that act comes into place. That's conservative because we know that Corporation A with two people and Corporation B with 2,200 people, they're going to react different when information is stolen. Hubris, arrogance, depending on how big it is. You know, are they really going to, are they going to call us tomorrow? Are they going to call the privacy commissioner and say, yeah, Jim Smith, his SIN number was stolen. I don't know, right? But at the end of the day, we had all this information and we gave it back to him. We said, so you're going to have 15,000 calls. So you've got six people in your office and you don't have a, com uh, a cert team. How's that going to, how's that going to work? So... Back to education, right? At the end of the day, it's their job to educate the public on what their roles and responsibilities will be around governance and about policy, but it's also their job to ensure that they're ready for the onslaught, right? And if they don't do those things, then they fail us from a societal perspective. And essentially, we fail because we're not, we're not completing the cycle. We're not going back to the, the foundation, which is the education component. So those are the three pillars from a literacy perspective, but ultimately, I think the underpinning here is education. And the education is a responsibility of each and every one of us at all levels. Back to the personal and the professional and the corporate. Okay? So, so I want to conclude with a thought. So go back to my opening story. So that parable Put some myopic focus on that and, and try to understand what the underpinning is. Right? The underpinning is on us. It's on you. You as a citizen of your province, your state, your country, this community as a whole, this massive ecosystem we're in from a cyber perspective to ensure that we move forward with these three key things. And they have to happen every single day. So my four-year-old goes to school. She gets up in the morning. What does she do when she goes to school? I know, because I pay for the school. So I figured out, what do you do? Well, you learn letters. You learn numbers. You learn colors. Well, why aren't you learning security of some fashion? She knows how to use this, but she doesn't know who's behind this, right? It's my responsibility, OK? So at the end of the day, if we don't take those proactive steps and behave in this fashion, then I believe that the engineering side, the tools, and the policies around enforcement will really become, you know, they'll sit on the end of the digital bookshelf. They'll be useless. Okay? So, that's my talk. Thanks, Ray.